79. One of the greatest teams in Penn football history. I got a chance to see this amazing team play. We'll talk about that uh, later on. But Chris, 1979, uh, many people who I've talked to said it's maybe one of the greatest teams in the history of Penn football. And yet they didn't bring home the, the hardware. And once again, I don't know how you judge a group if it's by bringing home the hardware or the rings or the ribbons or whatever the case may be. But this group uh, was ornery, physical, and absolutely tough as nails. Yeah, that was a, uh, it was a, uh, a very good group and we knew it was going to be a good group and uh, uh, they were tough all the way through and they, as a matter of fact, they won uh, Penn's uh, first playoff game. First time and we made a, made a big step because back then there was only like a, a grand total of uh, four to eight teams that even got in the playoffs. So, uh, you know, there wasn't any, you weren't, you didn't have a chance of uh, getting somebody easy. You were, you were playing tough as soon as the playoffs started. And uh, we, I remember uh, just jumping way ahead at the end, we beat Lafayette Jeff at home 7-0. I alluded to, uh, alluded to it uh, before on uh, Mark's injury that he had he had his senior year this year. And uh, people told me, he said, uh, Lafayette Jeff, Dave Knott was the coach. He said, uh, Jeff and Penn would play to midnight and nobody would score. And they were almost right. It was 7-0 uh, Penn. But anyway, it was a good year. And uh, the, one, uh, the one anecdote that, I mean, that, that sticks out that people laugh about. When we played uh, Mishawaka home and homecoming, that was the game that got us our, our new stadium. Our, there were people lined up all the way out to Bittersweet Road at three different ticket selling stations wanting to get tickets to get in. Uh, it was uh, it was just it was uh, an unbelievable uh, situation, uh, and uh, Mishawaka was undefeated and unscored upon. We were undefeated and given up one touchdown to Elkhart Central, so it was uh, two teams in the top three in the state, and the place was in a frenzy. Well, uh, this is the thing that's is a little humorous as it happened. Uh, both teams were just sky high and they kicked off to us and we put together like a 20 play drive to uh, he, he put together a 20 play drive and scored the first touchdown that Mishawaka had uh, given up all year so we're up 7-0 and the, our, our fans are in absolute frenzy the band people are going crazy but we kick off to them and they run the kickoff back for a touchdown. And now it's seven to seven and their fans are in absolute frenzy. Now they kick off to us and we start another long drive and after about seven plays, the quarter's over. But we're moving the ball. I mean, that was the problem. So we're switching ends and I looked over and there was Mark Osborne and Corey Goldman kicking over water buckets, throwing their helmets down just upset like crazy. Uh, Corey, Mark, what's your problem? We are moving the ball like crazy. We got a chance to score again. And Corey says the problem is this. He says the second quarter and we haven't been in the game yet. <laughs> So they're all fired up, and the quarter goes by, and our defense hadn't even got on the game, got on the field yet. So, uh, so they were all upset by that. But we ended up winning that game, and that was a uh, it was a great win for us. And I knew right then we would be, you know, we, we had a chance to go away. Started the season with four consecutive sh shutouts. Yeah. Finished the season with seven shutouts mm -hmm. in all. Going into the last game against the, the Brickies at the Brickie Bowl, you'd given up only 27 points 
in 11 games. Is this the greatest defensive team in Penn football history? Up to that point, then the 1983, you'd probably have to take over, giving up 140 yards rushing in a year. Which, as I say, will be a record that will never be touched. Watch it be broken next year. Mm -hmm. But I say it'd be tough, too. So the, the 1979 team, defensively, let's talk about what made them so good. You got guys like Kent Piotrowski, you got Corey. Uh, I mean, defensively, Mark Osborne, uh, Brent Keller, uh, Ken Verlink. 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 Uh, let's talk about those guys. Well, it was, uh, we had so many major uh, D1 players on that team. Uh, and plus the defense was had that was a returning defense basically from the year before with all that experience they'd had a winning undefeated season they'd given up some yardage but uh, uh, they were bigger and stronger and a lot more experience that was uh, that was a very very uh, a tough defense it was I mean I don't really like to even compare teams but when you, but you know, you, you look at the stats, the scoring stats there. You also look at, uh, you know, the '83 team giving up 140 yards rushing in a season is unbelievable. We've had some great, uh, some great stats. And uh, first of all, you know, offensively, we don't believe in the star system. I, I believe it's a team effort, and we're hardly ever. I mean, a thousand-yard rusher at Penn is the equivalent to a 3,000-yard rusher somewhere else because he's going to have to share time and we're going to and he's going to we're going to have to spread the ball around. But uh, you know, defensively, it's different, and uh, they they were tough. Uh, as I said, they were. Uh, you know, ten of them had quite a bit of uh, starting experience. Nine of them were full-time starters back. So uh, that was a, uh, a great defensive team. All right. Uh, we probably have to talk about the November 9th game. Uh, I was on the coaching staff at Hobart as a punk middle school coach at the time. And I remember uh, the atmosphere. So I want to talk about what many people in Northwest Indiana and certainly the Hobart people talk about is the greatest game in their school's history. Uh, this game has been well documented uh, when we put together our Hobart book, which really puts us in a position to do this book. Mm -hmm. So if one helped out the other, this is the reason we're sitting here at the table today. So let's just talk about going into the Hobart week. And on a side note, this is your first opportunity to go head to head against uh, one of the most influential people in my life. Don Howe. Your, yeah. your thoughts with Coach Howe? A great man. I enjoyed him so much and uh, <clears throat> the, the conversation that we had numerous times after that at clinics, everywhere we ran into each other, Don would shake my hand, he'd say that 79 game was the best game I've ever been involved with. I said, you know, Don, I thought the 83 was the best game I'd ever been involved with. We both laugh because we were one and one against each other, and that's probably the way it should have been. I mean, uh, they had a great program. The thing that I remember to start with, we got over there, it was cold and sleet, pitch black all the way over our bus ride, and we went in there. And as we were going up to our locker room, the Hobart kids, or excuse me, Hobart, <laughs> as I was corrected numerous times, the Hobart kids were on the field with shovel shirts. It's, it was below freezing and sleet and cold, and they were out there in shovel shirts walking around trying to give an uh, intimidation to our to our kids, you know, let them know this weather doesn't bother us. So I told one of our coaches, I said, well, they're trying to pull a little bit of uh, mojo on us before the game starts. And then about five minutes later, our coach says, I wouldn't worry about our kids being intimidated. 
I looked down, our kids were out there with no shirts on, bare skin, cold, walking along, the kid, looking at the field with the Hobart kids' shovel shirts, ours with no shirts. So that was kind of the way the game started. And uh, uh, the number one uh, play of the game was the very first play, excellent call. They called a middle screen. And we were going to get after Cobb's ugly, their quarterback. We wanted to get after him early. And he got back, and uh, usually we're real good at uh, reading screen, our kids are. But this time they wanted to get him so badly that everybody rushed, and he took off running for his life. At the very end, he jumped and threw it back to the middle, complete, went a long, long, long ways, changed field position around, and just a. Uh, that that uh, that first play kind of set the tone for their offense. I think gave them quite a bit of uh, a confidence. The thing I remember is you look around. There's no no seats available. They were ringing three, four, five deep all the way around the field, right up on the field. And I'll forget that the Cubs threw a ball that went over the receiver's head and he dove into the crowd. And then the crowd was separated and he came out holding the ball. <laughs> Official signal to the catch. I know somebody in the crowd caught it and gave it to him. But the officials there were worried about getting out of there too, I think. And uh, But it was, it was crazy. And uh, we had uh, two bad breaks that happened. That were, Number one, Steve Susky returned a punt with no time left in the first half and got tackled on the one yard line going in. Didn't got no points out of that. And then uh, the last four plays of the game, we're bombing the end zone trying to get uh, uh, a tie and score. And uh, and after the game, they said, "Would you have gone for two? Would you?" I, said, I didn't even want to think about that. Right? <laughs> we just lost the game and. Pick, and reporters want to know if we'd have gone for two, if we'd have scored, or we'd have gone over. I just, I said, I don't even want to talk about that. It was, uh, so uh, we ha I've seen a tape of that game, and uh, we didn't play extremely well. Our O line didn't have a great job, didn't do a, 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 a great job as they had been. But I think that's part of uh, the team you're playing. Take playing Hobart was an awfully good team. And, uh, the, the Hoper to then is not like the hope the you know modern day over they were one of the top teams and they absolutely stayed in the end in the highest class and uh, it was uh, and I know and the other thing I remember Donnie Hall told me about that game and he told me this a number of times he said geese we won the battle but lost the war he said you gave us such a physical pound and he said we had like six or seven guys some didn't play and some were just a shadow of themselves the next week he said if we i'd love to play that team healthy but you know that's that was just the way it was and uh, they returned to favor to us in 83 we won it went on to win the state but boy they gave us a pounding and i know our big running back in 83 kevin witkowski uh never took one snap that whole week and we didn't even eat it wasn't even until friday that he was cleared to play so I mean, that's just the way it was when Hobart and Penn played. The physical nature of the game. It wasn't dirty, though. Not it was, dirty at all. That's what was exciting about the, the rivalry, albeit only two games. I mean, it was physical. It was, I'm going to punch you in the face. Yeah. You're going to get punched in the face back. Yeah, it's what I, I mentioned before. Football coaches, I mean, I love Donnie Howell. He's a great friend. And... The game, the, if it didn't didn't affect my feeling for him one bit in '79, and I'm sure the the '83 game didn't affect his feeling for me. I mean, we went out and hugged, and he uh, shook my hand about broke it, of course, and uh, uh, but uh, that was just uh, it, it was a very physical game, a very clean game, and I mean there was so much, I think, respect of the. Uh, I know we respected their coaching staff and their team, and I think you kind of feel the same thing coming from them. I want to stay on this subject because this is something that's, I think, relative to where we're at right now in 2017. The impact that you've had in your community and the impact that Coach Howell in his community 
are really kind of a parallel because it set in motion a great group of coaches in, 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 in this day. In this season, Corey Yeoman is the head football coach at Penn. Former Hobart great Ryan Turley is now the head football coach at Hobart. And we've had all those legacy kids come and go. Little did you know when you guys were competing in 79 and 83 that your impact would have such an everlasting effect that's taken itself in already to a second generation. Did you think about that? Well, no, I don't, th I don't think you, know, you really can see that in the future, but it's really neat that it happened. Mm -hmm. And I knew after Corey had been with me for a while as an assistant, I knew he was going to be a great head coach, and uh, I'm sure that the people at Hobart thought the same about Turley. Now, uh, Coach Yeoman does not like to talk about 1979. He and I have sat down on numerous occasions, and this is painful as it was the day it happened, still. No, it isn't to me, because we went on to win five state championships and uh, make our own niche in, uh, in Indiana history, and that was just uh, one thing along the line. I mean, it's just that... Uh, you know, it was it was a game that, that we sure would have liked to win. I should have, would have liked to win, and uh, we had a chance to win it. But uh, it's not one of those games where you say we should have won. We very easily could have. But I mean, uh, I'm sure that uh, Hover can look at the film and figure it out and said, "Man, we could have won that game by three touchdowns." If so, I mean, it's one of those kind of games. And uh, no, I mean, it's. Uh, it's now, I mean, I can talk about it without any pain whatsoever, but uh, at the time it was, uh, it was a little bit tough. I remember the only thing that could, could be construed as bad sportsmanship is when they uh, set one of our cheerleaders' hair on fire, but that wasn't a player, that was one of the fans. And uh, I remember, uh, I remember saying to somebody, I said, hey, we can't buy any hair can <laughs> Rest that passer, and like three or four over people were like, I'll do that, coach, put me in. <laughs> and I mean, that was just, they were everywhere. I, that has to be the biggest crowd that was ever at uh, Hobart. And I remember the thing, the other thing that amazed me, uh, they had a drive going, the train stopped up and was hooting on the tracks. Even the trains for, for Hobart here, I said, they got everything going for them. That was great. And final th thought, uh, playing uh, in the Bricky Bowl, that was your, that was the only time there? Only time there. And of course, people talk about some of the great stadiums and, you know, Indiana lore, the Wrights Bowl down at Evansville, the Bricky Bowl and other places. It's a very unique situation. I, I, I would call it, it's, it's Wrigley Field and Fenway Park all into one. It's not in existence anymore today, but mm -hmm. really special aura about the place. Yeah, it, I'm very glad I got to, uh, got to ex experience it and uh, the, just the, the passion from the Hobart crowd. I just hope it's still like that today uh, because, I, I mean, that, they made that a very, very special place to play. And I was, uh, and I'll just say something about Hobart fans. Uh, we played them in the uh, semi state in, uh, in 1983, prior to our first state championship. Thursday practice, there was like eight campers out in our parking lot, and they were growing out. This is the night before the game, and uh, they came down and said, can we watch you practice? So we won't, we won't say anything. We just were football fans. And uh, and I believe they were true, but we, we felt like it was not in our best interest to have that happen. And I kind of apologized to him. I said, no, I said, I, I believe you. <laughs> I'm not a kid. But I said, no, we, we just got a little ritual we go through. We just kind of like to keep it among ourselves. And they understood. But I mean, how many times you see in high school do you see six or eight campers pull up the night before the game, cook out, and one watch the other team practice just because they're football fans? Pretty, pretty interesting to me.